Michael, thank you so hey, much. Hey, everybody turn off your cell phones, by the way, okay, yes. so that they don't uh, interrupt Eric while he's talking. Oh, God. Please. I made a list of some of the cases <laughs> which are interesting. And I've been extracted a few sort of rules of behavior or policies that I operate with. And you all are far more experienced than I in this area. But if you pick up anything from it, good. If you are shocked and say, what is this crazy guy doing in this crazy business? That's fine. But maybe some of it will find interesting. First, I'm going to tell you about that Texas Chainsaw Massacre case, which happened a few years ago. Oh no, sorry. I told you about that one the last time I was here. I'm going to tell you about another one. There was a television series named My Name is Earl. Anybody remember that? Star Jason Lee. Jason, ironically, was a very good friend of my younger son. And he used to come over to my office and hang out. A writer approached an attorney and said, you know that hit television series, My Name is Earl? Well, I wrote it, but I got no credit for it and no money for it. One thing led to another, and a pretty major lawsuit was filed by this attorney depicted up here, Stephen Law, and I'm going to play you a short clip. Anybody know Stephen? He's a very bright man. He lives and works in Beverly Hills. And he's very high IQ. He's one of the best experts in copyright that I know. He took the case on and he hired two expert witnesses. One was Nimmer, Nimmer on copyright, his son, who was, wrote the copyright book that everybody reads, who has a form and a way of analyzing a screenplay. And his attestation was that 90% of the screenplay was duplicated in the television. So that's more than chance, correct? 90%. But the other thing that had to be proven was that access to the screenplay was had. And that's why I was brought in. The writer sued the agency that represented the producer of the series, my name is Earl. He sued, I think it was 20th Century Fox that had produced the series, it was a five year long series. And he sued NBC, that was show. Those are heavy hitters. The issue came down to when and where could the agency and the producer they represented have seen or read the script. And this writer was kind of a, let's call him naive for the sake of this discussion. The writer said, well, I mailed it to the agency. That's what he said. He had no receipt, no nothing for that. But his girlfriend attested to under oath that she saw him mail it. Anyway. The agency had no record of having received the screenplay. And I came in and I was supposed to describe as an expert witness, usually I'm not taking sides, I'm just describing information. I was supposed to describe what happens to a screenplay when it arrives at an agency. And what happens is it goes into the mail room which does not log it in. It opens the envelope to make sure there's not a pipe bomb or E. coli or botulism on the envelope. And then they send it to an agent's secretary who logs it in. The thing that nobody knew, which I knew because I know the business, is there are two secretaries for every agent an administrative secretary and a creative secretary. And the creative one is the one who logs in the script and reads it. And the agency had only the administrative secretary said, well, I never saw this. And then they have to reveal 
She, in the meantime, had become the fiance of the producer of the series. <laughs> and so she wouldn't make a statement. Uh, this man, Stephen Lowe, well, they got some minor settlement that it because we could, we could not prove access because this poor guy had no record of having mailed it, no return receipt. But I'd like to play you this because there's a rather startling statistic in it which for the last 20 years, not a single case of copyright infringement against a studio has been won. And that's kind of extraordinary. So, and this is on YouTube and it's called uh, The Death of Copyright. Another case with which I was involved. And this is the one that I'm had concern about names, but to make it juicy, I want to give you a couple of names. I got a call late last year, very dignified sounding man, saying, are you the Eric Sherman who knows something about film? And I, I get so tired of hearing that. Yes, I won't read your script for free, by the way. It's usually what I say. But I said, yes, what can I do for you? He said, who was the first black billionaire in the U.S.? I thought for a moment, I said, Barry Gordy, founder of Motown. He said, nope, he was number two. I said, Oprah Winfrey, nope, she was number three. I said, Robert Johnson, founder of BET. He said, nope, number four. I said, I get it. He said, Reginald Lewis. Has anybody here heard of Reginald Lewis? 1992, he graduates from Harvard Law School. Nobody gives him a job. Michael Milken, the junk bond king. Remember Michael Milken? $8 billion. He sold the fraud, you know, junk bonds in the high 80s and was then uh, put in prison for fraud. And the poor guy had to give back $6 billion. So when he got out of prison, he only had $2 billion left. And he now is in charge of the Michael Milken Foundation. Maybe he's a nice man, I don't know. I don't know. Milken wanted to prove his public worth. He wanted to create a black billionaire, evidently. So he found this guy, Reginald, and arranged a $200 million loan and credit line with which Reginald bought a food company called Beatrice Foods. He sold it one year later 1993, I think, for $1.2 billion, thus becoming a black billionaire, the first one. He then writes his autobiography, Reginald does, and it's called, Why Should White People Have All the Fun? <laughs> and it becomes a New York Times bestseller. And you can see it on Amazon. And Reginald's a great book, and that was just like Jamie Foxx. Reginald then gets brain cancer and dies, 42 years old. In the meantime, he had married a Filipino woman named Loida, and they have two children who are not down gorgeous, half Filipino, half black. Beautiful girls. Loida shops this autobiography around Hollywood, trying to get somebody to buy it. It is purchased by the man who was calling me, whose name maybe I won't give, so everything will be simple. He's an established black businessman who was only worth 30 or 40 million dollars. He buys the rights to the book. He doesn't option them, he buys them. So he now owns it. Thus, all copyrights transferred to him. He commissions a script to be written so that he can show it to celebrities. Finds a guy, writes a script, shows it to the celebrities, and Denzel, Samuel Jackson, all those people saw it. Jamie Foxx falls in love with it, and he had won the Oscar for Little Ray Charles. And Jamie says, I want to star in this picture. And I've seen that letter in Jamie's personal handwriting. He said, I've got two years of commitments, just COVID for two years. The man who called me said to Jamie, fine, 
he called me because he was having a little trouble registering the script. The usual thing we do with scripts is we copyright, register, and register it with the Writers Guild of America. Neither of which particularly serves to protect the content, but they preserve to protect the date at which you've completed it. Such that you have a meeting with my nephew David after I have filed it, and David steals it, I can show a look, I wrote it before. All right. So the man who called me filed the script with the Writers Guild and the Library of Congress both of which groups reject the script because there's already been one written and filed. So I said, find out who holds copyright. And it was the name of a writer whom we never heard of. To make the long story short, this woman, the widow of the first black billionaire, was my definition would be psychotic. She had no sense that she had sold it. She commissioned a writer to write it after she no longer owned it. I advised that my client, by this time he was my client, contact the writer who filed it, and he did. He said, how were you authorized to file this or to write it? And he said, oh, well, Mrs. Lewis, Lloyd Lewis, asked me to. He produced an email from Lloyd to the writer saying, oh, I think you should write a book based on my husband, write a script based on my husband's autobiography. So flagrant malfeasance. I'm right. I, I, this is obvious. For you guys, I should. Never disclosed to the man who bought it that she commissioned another script when she no longer owned it. Everybody was caught between rocks and hard places. They called her to an arbitration at the writer's guild. And as Stephen was talking about, he's pushing for them to take a more active hand. But you see, the writer's guild makes its money based on the percentages of fees paid to writers. Those fees are paid by the studios. Everybody's afraid of the big studios because they have the power. So at this uh, arbitration, the attorney on our side, very smart man, said, would you ever authorize somebody else to write a script after you would sold it? And she said, no, what do you think? I'm crazy and criminal? She said, would you please read this email? She read the email. Oh, this is, is this your email? Yes, it's from my email address. Please read it. As she was reading it, when she got halfway through it, she went nuts. Stood up, started yelling, started talking about the Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> threw things all over the room and was bringing Satan down to slay these bad people who had imputed her. This is a big thing that I know. They took her out of the room under restraint. This is a person with a billion, $1.2 billion. Now, to make this story even more insane, the findings of the arbitrator were that the man who bought the screen, that bought the rights to the book, hadn't fulfilled one of the promises that he made which was to make a movie within five years. In the Writers Guild was something called the buyback clause. If you buy a property, not option, but buy it, you have to produce a movie within five years, otherwise the seller has the right to repurchase it. And that is so that the studios can't just buy up a piece of work to take it out of the marketplace. Well, he had promised in his contract that he would make a movie within five years. He made a 30 minute short, kind of looked like an A&E type short. And the issue was, had he delivered or not on his promise? Neither side really won because 
a movie wasn't defined as feature length or feature length quality. The arbitrator, with whom I totally disagree, by the way, said, yes, but everybody knows you meant a feature length film with big stars. My view is not, no, everybody doesn't know that. You have to specify. So the finding of the arbitrator was that she had no, what she wanted was to have the book back. She had no right to have the book back because he paid her and he now owned the book. But he had no right to make a movie based on the name of the book. Since you can't copyright a title, I don't even know what finding, what, what he was basing this. Cannot be protected under copyright except the unique arrangement of it. That anybody could make a film. So that was the point. So both sides were lost. My opinion is it all stems back to the lack of definition of a movie. And this leads me to my first principle. If it isn't written, it isn't true. Now, a movie, if you look up the U.S. Copyright Office definition of movie, it's kind of interesting, motion picture. A series of images simulating motion or something like that. That would mean you could put 24 images together, that would take one second to project, and it simulates motion. It's a movie. There are great works of art made by experimental filmmakers that are nine seconds long. So, if you ever have a client or ever in a position to negotiate a deal regarding the purchase of a screenplay, rights to a book, or anything else, specify the project. Do you get my point? So, I felt bad because both sides really lost. She was rent made to look insane, which she probably is, and criminal, which she definitely is. So if it isn't written, it isn't true. Make no assumptions. If you write or sign a contract, know what every word means. You might think a movie means something, but is it a short movie, a long movie, a documentary movie, a fiction movie, or whatever? Have a good legal dictionary, such as Black's, and a good English dictionary, such as the Oxford New American at hand. You must understand what you're signing. You only have yourself to blame if you sign a corrupt agreement. If you don't understand a word, find out what it means, either by looking it up or asking. I've been in this business my whole life, and I still ask questions. As often as not, if I don't understand a word, neither does the person who wrote it. A real business person not only doesn't think less of you for asking, he or she will respect it. If anyone makes fun of you for wanting to know, this is not your friend. So I'm at the point now where I'll read my own contracts and I highlight any words that I don't understand. By count, nine out of ten were not understood by the author who wrote the contract. It's staggering. The amount of millions and millions of dollars wasted uh, is shocking. All right. I have stated in an early article, earlier article that your best friend can be your attorney. And that is some, I'm very fond of bashing professions. I have never bashed attorneys. <coughs> all of the good ones with whom I work always ask, prior to any negotiation, what do I want from a certain business relationship? Specifically, what is absolute and what is negotiable? So your attorney can be your best friend if you're in show business. It's common not to think that way. It's common <coughs> to bash them. What they say are you know what. So I promote this viewpoint very much. All right. Another remarkable case. You may ask, what does this have to do with show business? But you'll see. A man living in Orange County sued a bowling alley in Orange County because he slipped in the lane. And any of you bowl? 
Badly. In front of the line, it's a little greasy. There's a grease there by it, so the ball will skid there. The man, who was 72, was showboating for his girlfriend. He throws his ball, and to show off to his girlfriend, he jumps over the line, is dancing a jig, slips and falls. <laughs> he sued the bowling alley $5 million. Why? They didn't tell him that there was grease. <laughs> well, you've got common sense, don't you? I guess not. <laughs> yeah. Not only that, he sued them for another, I think, $10 million because he lost his manhood. He could no longer get an erection. What? Loss of consortium, we call it. Yeah. I remember that term. Now I know what it means. Well, something about this didn't make sense. Now, furthermore, his justification for these amounts of money was that he was a professional trumpet player who was just getting ready to go online with a trumpet school, trumpet lessons. And his estimated earnings was 15 million. I thought that sounded a bit odd. He's <laughs> <laughs> Louis Armstrong. I was brought in to dig some stuff up on this. So first, he had provided to the law firm on Discovery a document demonstrating that he had been to a doctor for erectile dysfunction. So I, being knowing not much about that subject, you know, <laughs> uh, said, well, hmm, if he's been to this doctor, I wonder when he started going to this doctor. So we got the medical records. He'd been going to this doctor for 10 years before he slipped and fell. Yeah, but it got worse. <laughs> <laughs> David, my yeah. nephew is not yeah. yeah. You've seen some wackos. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, here's the kicker. I have a lot of friends in the music industry, one of whom has what is known as the most successful online music school. He's a keyboard artist, which is much more popular than trumpet. He's had his website up for 10 years. He's made an aggregate of less than a million dollars in 10 years. And he says he's far and away the most successful. So I provided this information to our side and the guy backed off his claims. What the heck is this? So I have another principle my first one was, if it isn't written, it isn't true. The next principle is research, research, research. In this information age, with Google and everything else having so much data available, go into a search mode. Type in the person or the company you're considering. Read every article and interview you can. Find out how, how happy and healthy their employees are. Find out how many lawsuits they've been involved with. If I hadn't come onto the case, maybe they would have come to this anyway. But it seemed to me to find out how long the guy has been going for his erectile dysfunction and find a website that is well known and well established and find out what the guy has made. That was to me obvious. So now we have the types who sign contracts and don't and never intend to follow them. And they assume they will stare you down or talk you down with threats. For instance, you all know the great, brilliant, genius guitarist Jimi Hendrix, right? A genius and a very sweet man. I knew him in New York. Not the drug addict he was portrayed as being. Yeah, he did drugs, but he really wasn't that interested in it and an absolute genius and a very sweet man, the shyest, one of the shyest major celebrities I had ever met. We used to go over to Electric Ladyland, a studio in New York City, and he'd be practicing Bach, cantatas and stuff. Serious musician. When he was still alive in 1969, he gave a two-hour concert at Royal Albert Hall in London. It was filmed by a man who hired me to be an expert witness. 
It was filmed on 60 millimeter film. I saw a version of it. Far and away the greatest rock documentary I've ever seen. Far and away. Absolute genius. And this is why Eric Clapton and Pete Townsend and The Who and The Beatles and everybody says that Jimmy was the genius of all of them. The most brilliant. And the rehearsal, he's playing acoustic guitar. The most brilliant stuff. Jimmy died suddenly of a drug overdose. And he had three relatives, a father, a brother, and a sister. The father was an alcoholic and a criminal. The brother was an alcoholic and a criminal. And the sister was a hairdresser in Seattle. The courts gave the entire state to the sister. She still manages the state and he died 30 plus years ago. 40 years ago, 1970 years ago, 43 years ago. We estimate, doing some uh, counting, that they have made an average of $1 million a month for 40 years. That's a lot of money. Jimmy authorized the man who hired me to film this concert and release it in whatever way he wanted. And I saw the letter signed by Jimmy. Quite exciting, actually. The sister was trying to get an injunction against his release in the film. Why? He was holding out for a 2000 screen wide release. She wanted to release it in six theaters. Now you wonder, well, why would she want a small, limited release? And why would she get in the way the guy wanted a big release? They own the six theaters that she wanted to release it. So it was an insider job. They wanted the revenues and, you know, fancy engagement and charge $20 instead of $10. All about money. So the guy who owned the rights, signed over by Jimmy, one Jerry Goldstein, one of our chosen tribe, Jerry, wonderful guy, my age, a contemporary of mine. He, the film was so great that I just said, look, it's an outrage and so on. So they got a settlement. Now, what the heck was that? She never intended to honor her brother's contract. She was obviously looking at it solely as a money play. She wanted to stay friendly with Sony because Sony keeps Jimmy's name and catalog out there. Had nothing to do with anything. If she had said to the man, look, here's what I'm doing. Why don't you just be honest? I imagine he might have cut a deal and it would have been so much simpler for all in life. That leads to another principle. Make sure that in any agreement you make with another, both sides can win. That's a principle that I operate on. No one likes to be taken advantage of. And in fact, it's on you if you allow it to occur. There's a fine balance between money and creative. Both sides must have an opportunity to succeed. If an investor's funds are entirely at risk, and if he has no recourse, if he loses all his money, what is that worth to him, to you? At the same time, the creative artist gives the money person a playing field. That's where the heck of a lot itself. So my opinion is, on planet Earth, especially at this time, if both sides can't win, why play that game? Because the hatred and animosity and desire for revenge will come back. I believe it's possible to create agreements where both sides can win. Michael, what do you think about that fact? Sure, it's possible. It's possible. You have to have honesty, people willing to confront the issues, put them on the table. Mm -hmm.